Welcome back to video two on our writing test for Golang applications video series. In the last video, we set up our very first uh, test. We, we still have it here. We're testing a string converter function. We had an input and an expected output. And if those two match, then we were happy and the test wouldn't fail. Otherwise, it would fail. For now, for the second video, we want to test some error cases. And we also want to get into failing early. So if you don't know what failing early means or why you would care about that, just watch the video and I'll tell you in a moment. So for this um, test here, we were testing basically the happy path. So let me modify the name for this into happy path, just so that I can copy paste it. And uh, this one we're gonna call, so I just scrolled down here, the other one is still up here. This one, instead of happy path, we're gonna call error path or unhappy path or whatever you want to call it. So for here, we know from our function here. So um, this is, of course, completely arbitrary, um, but I just came up with this. If the input length is seven, for whatever reason, uh, this function is going to error. And it's going to error with input length is seven, which is forbidden. So um, let's do something here that we have exactly seven characters. So let's just go through numbers until seven. So now we know that um, the uh, input is going to be uh, or that the output is going to be an error. So we don't need this expected output anymore because we don't care about the output. We uh, care about the error. So what I like to do in this case is um, go for something like expected error. You can then either just test for the message or create a new error. Here I'm just doing thumbed.errorf to create a new error. And I'm going to put in input is seven, which is forbidden. So this is my expected error message. At least I think so. Let me just check. Input input length is seven. Okay. Input length is seven, which is forbidden. So this is the error that we're going to expect. What we can do here now is ignore this first. So in Golang, if you don't care about a variable, you ignore it with an underscore. And you also have to do that because the compiler is going to complain if you just declare a variable and don't use it, which many people consider annoying at first, but I love it because it um, just helps you uh, avoid errors. So let's remove this down here because we don't have that anymore. And now what we want to do here is not test if the error is nil anymore, but basically we want to test if the error is our expected error. And uh, this right here is not going to work, and I'll uh, show you why in a second. But first, let's fix our message. So we're saying expected error to be this thing, but got this thing. And then here we have the expected error and the error. Or you could also call this actual error or something like this. So let's run our test. No, sorry, not go run test, go test. And I was just about a bit confused here for a second. Why is this uh, passing now? Here, of course, we don't want to test if it's, we don't want to error if it's, um, if it's the expected error, but if it's not the expected error. Now, if we run this again, so now we're saying expected error to be input length, which is seven, which is forbidden, but got input length uh, is seven, which is forbidden, which is exactly the same. So why is this error not failing? And this is because error in Golang is just an interface and uh, basically, we don't know what this is, so we're comparing two different objects that are not, in fact, identical. What we care about, though, is the message. So what we can do is say if error.error, .error, which gives us the error message back, do that here, is not this thing, then we want to error. So let's run our test again. And now our test is fine. However, we have introduced another problem, and this is why I wanted to get into failing early. So this is fine right now, but let's say um, we change our code and for whatever reason here, we no longer say this is seven, but we say this is eight. So what would you expect to happen now? I think a reasonable expe expectation would be that the test fails. However, what happens is this. It doesn't just fail, it panics. And why does it panic here? We see a invalid memory address or nil pointer dereference. So what does that mean? Let's go back to our test. And what we can see here is we were calling this error.error .error message, message. However, our test still tests for this seven character message here, which of course uh, creates no error at the moment. That also means that the error, which is just an interface in Golang, is now actually nil. So what we're doing is calling nil.error. 
and that of course gives us a null pointer dereference. So just like in regular code, what you would do to prevent this kind of null pointer or null dereference errors is you would check for it. So what we can do here is first say if error is not nil, then we can say t dot f expected error not to be nil, but was nil. However, that doesn't fix it yet. As I'll show you, if we run this, we're getting the same the same issue. And that is because our test is not exiting early. So what we're doing here is, yes, this is erroring, so it's printing the error, but then we're still running into this here. So to show you, if I just comment this out for a moment here, ah, now I'm running into um, this unused variable. So let me also remove that for a second. If I comment this out, and again, of course, I switched those here, so we don't want to check if it's not nil, we want to check if it's nil. This is the case that we want to prevent. So, sorry about that. Let's go again. Now we can see expected error not to be nil, but was nil. So, um, you can see this is now working, but if we have all of this here, we are still running into this panic, which is because we're not failing early. And what we can do for that is we can either say t dot fail now. Let's see. And now we're getting expected error not to be nil, but was nil. And as you can see, we're never getting into uh, the second message. So um, let's now make this test uh, create an error. So I make the function create an error again. And now if we run the test again, the test is fine. And now let's see if we ever get into the second uh, message. Let's say input length is eight, which is forbidden. And now the test is failing because the input length is eight, but the message is still saying seven. So to get the test to pass again, we can change our actual code here, saying input length is eight. And now we're good again. So what you can also do instead of um, calling error F and then fail now, you can also do that in a more concise fashion in a single command by simply calling t dot fatal or fatal f. And in that case, actually fatal would be enough because we don't have any formatting directive. So run it again, test is fine. And also if we remove a character here, test is still fine. Of course it's failing because uh, that's what we want, but it's not panicking anymore. So this is what we call failing early. And as you can see, it's extremely useful because it basically stops as soon as a condition is not met, when you already know uh, that checking for a further condition is impossible if this first one is not met. So this is very, very useful, especially on error cases. So this was video two. You learned about uh, testing for an error message and you learned about uh, failing early. But if we look at this code now, it's a bit verbose, right? So we're kind of doing almost the same thing in test one and test two. And if you have these kind of tests where just different inputs should lead to different outputs and you want to test for those cases and maybe include a couple of edge cases, what you can do is write table driven tests to make that a bit more concise and easier to add new tests. And that is what I'll show you in the next video. So make sure to subscribe that you don't miss it. And if you like this video, I'm happy to receive your thumbs up. Thank you very much and see you in the next one.